Well, hi, this is Paul. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a, an idea that I'm promoting right now. It's, well, I'll hopefully promote it for years and years to come, but it, it's the idea that all writing is essentially argumentative, as you can see by the title. Um, <clears throat> this is not a brand new idea. Other people have had the idea before, um, but it's not something that's it's talked about much, and um, the reason I'm bringing it to your attention is because there is um, a push for argumentative writing in the Common Core State Standards. Whether you teach English Language Arts, or you teach Science, or you teach JROTC, or you teach PE, or you teach Algebra, um, there is uh, evidence that people are astounded by when they really um, study it and analyze it, is that when our kids write about uh, what they're learning. They learn it better. And so what I want to talk about is that any piece of writing that we uh, either study because we're reading it to learn about something or if the students do the actual writing themselves uh, that essentially it's argumentative no matter what kind of writing it is. Okay. So I'm going to start by looking at this screenshot of uh, an angel uh, repository, the LOR, and what we're looking at here is uh, the student textbooks for high school, as you can see right there. So, uh, you know, you've got these folders for the different subject areas, right? And I'm in the high school, of course. Um, <clears throat> and what I've done is I've gone into some of these, like the science and uh, JROTC and history social studies and um, I can't remember what other types you'll see in the in the presentation. Um, and I've pulled out some texts, and I've uh, made it possible for us to see those pieces of text as argumentative. Okay, so uh, here's uh, a, an image to help us, um, uh, you know, visualize what I'm talking about. The, the most common types of writing that you see. Uh, when when you know you read books about what are the types of writing, it's usually called expository, descriptive, narrative, and persuasive. Those are the the, the main types. But there are, you know subtle differences and and little branches from them. So there's expository, and uh, it's being called informational quite a bit. Uh, it's called informational in the Common Core Standards, so everybody's talking about informational text. You've got to have informational text, which is true. Um, and th there's this uh, uh, percentage that is in the standards uh, for uh, science and history and other technical subjects, which basically means all the subjects that are not English language arts. And they say that 70% of what a student reads uh, in the course of a day should be informational text. That's not to say that 70% of the English language arts class should be informational text. That's 70% of what a kid reads in a day should be informational text. Okay, so your poetry, your drama, your short stories, your novels, etc., those should be done uh, mostly in the English class and um, the students should be reading informational text in their other coursework. Um, Explanatory is also kind of, it kind of fits in this um, in this category. Okay, then you have narrative writing, which is where you tell a story. Descriptive is where obviously you describe things, and literary text, of course, kind of falls in that um, category. Um, you have analytical writing, where you analyze uh, an idea, or you analyze a, another text, or you analyze uh, uh, um, you know. In science, for instance, you might analyze uh, a scientific uh, theory or a study that's been conducted. And critical, uh, when you criticize those things. Okay, What I'm trying to say, obviously, from the arrows is that the, they're all essentially argumentative. When you have informational text, what you're hoping is that the reader um, adopts this information to be true, agrees with it to be true, um, understands it and accepts it as true. You're arguing, even though you're not saying, "I believe that you know 
the this is the way that the chemical reaction works you are writing about it you're providing information and the goal is to have the reader come away with that uh, uh, you know understanding and agreeing with that information okay in narrative or descriptive writing you are arguing you're hoping that the reader um, adopts that perspective or agrees with that um, artist's definition of beauty or uh, tragedy or etc okay and analytical and critical writing of course you're arguing that uh, there's a pers particular perspective or idea uh, that you know is worthy of consideration okay so in essence all of these types of writing are argumentative okay so if you're willing to go with me there um, let me provide a few examples okay this first is uh, from the Holt McDougal physical science book at the high school level and I've gone to uh, I don't remember which chapter but it's it, it's about um, chemical structure okay and so we have this idea about compounds with network structures are strong solids okay now strong uh, is relative right strength has to be compared from one thing to another therefore this is a subjective statement it's one of opinion okay so now we have this piece of text uh, that is designed as an argument to prove this opinion okay so uh, and it does it very successfully I think quartz is sometimes found in the form of beautiful crystals. It has a chemical formula of, uh, however you say that, silicon dioxide, something like that. Um, and then we have the structure of it, and we see that it has um, 109.5, um, all of the, the angles, right? And then we have this diagram here that shows just how very strong uh, this structure is and then we get uh, more uh, discussion of it it takes a lot of energy to break the strong bonds okay a lot well okay again we're back to relativism and we're back to subjectivity and so we have even though this is informational text there's an argument being made here and the student can if we teach the student to um, see the structure of, of argumentative writing then they can um, use that structure to their advantage to see okay what's being argued here and um, what am I supposed to walk away from uh, as far as my understanding of this okay so the argument here explicit argument that quartz is strong rigid and inflexible all right so that was the science example let's look at geometry I got this from the the angel folder it went into the text and pulled out this um, chapter about uh, congruent angles okay congruent parts of triangles etc so we first have this image uh, to, to kind of pull the, the student in it's kind of a you know preview to the text okay now here's you know after they've already been exposed to the formulas and how things should work they have a question Construction builders use the king post truss for the top of a simple structure. In this truss, ABC is congruent to ABD. So we have ABC should be congruent to ABD, right? And we have um, this uh, focus on builders, right? So it's not just generic triangles now it's uh, being applied to real life situations so we have this implicit argument that congruent parts congruent congruent corresponding parts of shapes matter to the student's life because they're actually used in real life and if these parts aren't congruent then the roof over your head might fall apart when the wind blows right so this actually matters so this this is the implicit argument that yes they want them to understand the formula and figure it out and use it um, in different ways but also 
they're hoping that the student realizes that this stuff actually matters in real life. Okay, and then we have again number seven, the attic frame truss, um, EFG, that would be EFG right there, this triangle here, should be congruent to HIJ. Same thing, if those aren't congruent, perhaps we have problems. <clears throat> so, Pearson argues implicitly that learning how to determine whether triangles are congruent is a valuable real-life skill with practical implications. So it's not stated directly, but it is implicit. Okay, So there's argumentative text in this Pearson geometry textbook. Alright, Houghton Mifflin, AP American History. So if you're uh, in 11th grade, you're uh, college bound, you're in AP class, this text is um, more complex as it should be for AP students. Okay, And it's a discussion of Alexander Hamilton. And so we start off with, um, it, it, it's really a discussion uh, because they're, they're forming a new government and how strong should the federal government be. And he he, according to this text, happened to be one who argued in favor of a very strong central, federal, national government, however you want to say it. All right. So we have here, like many nationalists, he believed that the American people were incapable of displaying consistent self-sacrifice and virtue, concluded that the federal government's survival depended not on building popular support, <laughs> but by cultivating politically influential citizens through a straightforward appeal to their financial interests. Huh. Okay, so, you know, the whole lobbying piece there is, is born out of this idea from Hamilton, I guess. So, um, then we have a discussion of who he was as a, as a person. He was charming, he was brilliant, he was also vain, he was handsome, he was a notorious womanizer, uh, he thirsted for fame, so he was ambitious. Um, so he was all of these things. He was a, f uh, a total human being, right? And to his opponents, he embodied the dark forces luring the Republic to its doom. A man who believed in the necessity of either force or corruption to govern men, uh, says Thomas Jefferson. So uh, he wasn't always uh, appreciated by his contemporaries. And so all of this text is supposed to be informational to the student, right? Uh, some historian has studied Alexander Hamilton and studied primary documents like those written by Thomas Jefferson and put this piece together to help us understand um, what Alexander Hamilton uh, believed, what he fought for, and, and how he was criticized by his peers. So we have an explicit argument that Hamilton advocated for a strong central government influenced by wealthy citizens. All right, so it's, it's very uh, much on the surface, this argumentative piece of text. So for history and social studies, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's easier to see how uh, most of the text, even though it's informational, is argumentative in nature. Okay. Let's move on to uh, JROTC text. So I went into the angel folder for JROTC and got this um, leadership education and training text. So this is the Let2 book. And this is about maps. All right. So the following situation shows you how to orient a map without using a compass. And then we have a situation. All right. So Barry is at a bike rally and he traveled off the main road and became lost. He knew for certain he was lost when he came upon the main entrance to the North Fork State Park on his right. Um, there was a small bridge there which crossed the North Fork River. So we have some, uh, you know, indicators that we can get our bearings from these things using the map. And he took the following steps. All right, so what did he do? He determined his location, getting two known port points. So he used the bridge and he used the river. Okay, now he found these things on the map. He uh, rotated the map until it was in the same uh, orientation that he was, uh, for, so, so it aligned to his, his perspective. And then he checked to ensure that the park entrance was correctly aligned 
with its actual location and he checked to see if the map symbol for the park was also on the right side of the road so with his map properly oriented he realized what direction he had to take and he was able to rejoin the bike rally pretty cool okay so we have the idea that you can use a map successfully without a compass and then we have a real life situation in which uh, a person does it um, and then we have a discussion of it and this last piece here the next time you're on a trip to a place where you've never been before try this method it works you'll be able to navigate your way to your destination much easier so we have a couple of things going on here uh, a very explicit case for uh, how you can use a map without a compass successfully to find where you need to go you also have this implicit argument that you know although JROTC courses are not designed for recruitment for the uh, for military um, however it, it 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 is funded by the military it comes from the military and there's a um, there's a strong um, connection between the armed forces and JROTC so through all this you have an implicit argument that soldiers learn how to use maps really well and they use them uh, for their missions etc so you have this explicit argument that reading is useful to help you find your destination that's very much on the surface of this you have an implicit argument that soldiers are skilled map readers right so I mean if you ask any soldier <clears throat> how do you use maps to do what you do most of them can say oh I use them all the time I used them when I did this when I did that etc okay so uh, just to recap I'll come back to the top here I, uh, I'm using our text that we have available to us in Collier County Public Schools my argument if you will is that um, any text that you're uh, reading or analyzing or writing as a student is essentially argumentative and then um, I've got some examples here that uh, I think successfully proved my point. Now, why does all this matter? Because argumentative writing um, has a, a structure to it that you can use to um, to understand it better. So, in any piece of argumentative text, you have a claim. Uh, another way to say a claim is a thesis. You know, the main point that uh, someone's trying to make. Um, there's always support for that claim, right? Um, there's always uh, at least uh, a, a kind of beginning, middle, and end kind of structure to it that you can identify. Um, so all these pieces, and there are, are more details we can go into uh, in, a, in a closer uh, look at argumentative writing. But the point of this little presentation is just to get across the point that our texts are argumentative, plain and simple. Okay. So if you're with me on that, then um, we're putting together some other pieces to look at the structure of argumentative writing and how we can use that with our students to understand their content better. So if you're a science teacher, how do you get them to understand chemical structure better than they do? Um, this might be a great way to do it. Okay. So this is Paul signing out and of course you can contact me through email or you can call me at 377-0099 if you have questions or comments. All right, take care.